Welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. South Africa is being urged to move with greater urgency to finalise transition support for its domestic motor manufacturing industry. Terence Creamer joins me to discuss the risks and opportunities being raised. Hi Terence. Hi Chanel. To start with, South Africa still has a significant automotive manufacturing capability. Yes, I mean we've got seven original equipment manufacturers or OEMs and an eighth emerging uh, in the Eastern Cape. So we've got, we've sustained this industrial base and it's an advanced manufacturing base and it's got backwards linkages into a component sector that's become fairly sophisticated. And we've really changed the architecture of this industry. We've always had an automotive industry and a manufacturing capability, but in the 1990s, after we opened up post-apartheid, there was, it really faced an existential crisis and there was a real risk that that whole manufacturing complex would, would leave. And it was basically through the joint efforts of the OEMs and government where they incentivized and created a support framework to, to lit literally shift the industry over the period from being an, uh, based on inward industrialization behind very high tariff barriers towards one that was integrated into the, the, the global systems of the OEMs. So they, were ex so they became ex more export focused and therefore far more competitive, so integrated and competitive. So we've got this base now, we produce passenger cars, but mostly we, we're becoming well known for the buckies that we produce. So, and th the balance now is a sort of 60-40, sort of on average, where 60% of the production of these, these facilities in Gauteng, KwaZulu-Natal and the Eastern Cape are exported to markets mostly uh, in the UK and Europe and uh, the, the balance is sold in South Africa and then obviously we've got a, a massively sophisticated automotive industry ecosystem ar around that with retail networks, servicing networks and uh, using these uh, offsetting mechanisms that are allowed in the framework which is currently called uh, the APDP and the second version of that, that's the support framework, allows these offsetting mechanisms to bring in imported vehicles so we've got a lot of choice as South African motorists in terms of, uh, of what we can drive. It's always controversial because we pay for this as taxpayers, as South Africans to sustain this industry but the cost benefits of maintaining this massively highly high-tech uh, advanced manufacturing platform in South Africa uh, has been seen as outweighing the costs. There are concerns though that this capacity will not be sustained unless policies and incentives are put in place to support new energy vehicles. Yes, so we're in a massive transition. We know in the electricity sector as well, or energy sector, we're undergoing a massive energy transition. The same sort of transition is happening and taking place in the world of mobility. And uh, basically we're moving towards more electric mobility. Uh, and this is driven by sort of climate change uh, imperatives. And what we're seeing now in the world is that uh, the internal combustion engine in several markets, particularly ones that we export to, so the UK and the European Union, are going to be banned. So from 2030 in the UK, you won't be able to sell an internal, new internal combustion engine. And from 2035 in the European Union now, three in every four of our cars that are exported <laughs> from South Africa go into either the UK, which is our biggest single market, or into the, uh, the European Union markets of Germany, Belgium, Netherlands, etc. So these are, this, this is a, we're facing now an existential crisis once again, much like we did in the 1990s, but off a fairly sophisticated and robust base, we must say that, but we have to make uh, serious decisions about how we're going to create the supportive environment to allow these OEMs to transition from the current platforms, RCE platforms as they're called, to mostly BEV, battery electric vehicle platforms. Obviously there's hybrids, there's also fuel cell electrics, but I think in the passenger segment it's going to be a BEV, a battery electric vehicle game, and therefore you need to be looking at how you're going to structure the industry to ensure that they can transition and start manufacturing battery electric vehicles to sustain those export markets. What are some of the arguments being put forward regarding a support framework? The government's position is this must be production-led. So we've got this APDP framework 
and basically tweak that and support uh, these OEMs um, to try and start making battery electric vehicles or hybrids or whatever platform they can get from their parent companies and export them into the existing markets, not trying to find new markets for old IC engines. And they believe the incentive exists because we already have these markets and we have these relationships and we've, you know, we've got a fairly, uh, you know, we've got a fairly competitive industry in terms of getting into these, uh, these markets. And that there's, there's an, that's an incentive for immediately for the OEMs uh, to start transitioning away from ICE engines or dri drivetrains towards the, the, the future drivetrain. The industry itself is saying that's not sufficient. A production-led approach they don't believe is sufficient. They say, yes, 60% does go abroad. But 40, that 40% 40 that they sell from those factories into the local market is a very important driver. And they need signals there too to start boosting demand uh, in, the, uh, in the local market for battery electric vehicles. And they say the pre price premium is over 50% at the moment. We, so they need <laughs> some sort of so demand side incentives for those customers. Now we know we're in a highly fiscally constrained environment. There's just no money, uh, easy money available for government to create a massive uh, demand side incentive. So government is very resistant to this and they still want a very much a production led. They really are going to resist, you know, incentivizing the consumer end um, of this. So they had odds, there's no agreement, but the clock is ticking because what happens is these companies have to compete internally for these platforms and they have to show signals to their parent companies that South Africa is ready to make the shift and we are not yet getting those clear signals. So we need to, whatever we decide, whether it's going to only be production led or there's gonna be a mix of incentives, we actually may have to make that call and we have to do it in a co collaborative way and listen to what the industry needs. But the issue is, it is a, there are some major questions here because the big component um, that comes into a battery electric is really the battery. And now we don't have any battery capabilities at that scale. And, uh, you know, the issue is where are those batteries going to come from? <laughs> you know, there's a whole thing. That the reason why we're able to export to the UK and the EU is we have free trade agreements. So we can get in there uh, with zero quotas, zero tariffs. But if the battery, which is going to be a big part of the value of the vehicle, is sourced from a market outside of South Africa, say, for instance, China, there's going to be rules of origins issues and they're going to say, well, is this really a South African vehicle or is it a Chinese vehicle, for instance? So we have to get our head around how are we going to do this and we're just not there yet. And really this issue about the production cycles, it's really, you know, three to five years ahead, these automotive companies make these decisions and we've already missed the, apparently one of the cycles. Um, and we, we're getting close to the next cycle with the decisions. Now we see there's different philosophies within South Africa. So VW South Africa, they're actually going hard to get the, another RCE platform. And they'll be focusing heavily, I think, on trying to diversify more into the African market with that RCE platform, given that UK and the European markets are going to be closing quite soon. And, you know, you know they might have those hard stop dates of 2030, but the impacts will be felt far closer. So they're going with a different strategy. But on the whole, the, 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 the OEMs want to, are saying to government they need to transition, they need the signal. The signals aren't there, aren't there yet. At the same time, these OEMs need to compete for these platforms amid questions about South Africa's attractiveness as an investment destination. This is a very big point because they're competing internally, you know, so within VW, within Mercedes-Benz, within BMW, they're competing with each other against other jurisdictions. Thailand comes up a lot, but we're competing against European plants and we're competing against Brazilians. Uh, so it's, it's a real competition. They're all bidding for these platforms. And, you know, with the battery electric vehicle, it seems you need a critical mass, you know, of units, which we are fairly small volume. Um, um, I'm not sure, sure of the figures, but I heard sort of 300,000 units is sort of the baseline, which is we don't get anywhere near that, any of our factories. So decisions have to be made, but it's in a climate that's quite hostile. 
and the biggest hostility at the moment is relates to load shedding. And uh, you know most of these uh, companies are ring fenced. You know they take load curtailment. They don't get load shed like we do at our houses and offices because of the importance to the economy. But once it gets to certain stages of load shedding, so stage five and above, the municipalities or ESKIM you know, can't exclude these companies. And we're really hearing that shifts are being disrupted. Thousands of workers are being sent home at times. We saw the massive disruption uh, at four recently when the pylons collapsed in Trine. So it's, this is a real problem. And they're having to explain this to the American, German, a Japanese, you know, principles, and it's not an easy thing to explain. What is load? What is load shedding? You know, it's a big question in these capitals. So, and then on top of it, the logistics issues are really biting now, and are actually eroding their sort of ability to make profits. So they, you know, what the, the basically the, the transnet issues and the road issues, and then we saw the floods in KwaZulu Natal. It really disrupted logistics and it's becoming very very expensive and we are you know a far destination from these main markets and we what's happening in the meantime is places like Morocco and Egypt are aggressively pursuing um, these these opportunities and already Morocco has overtaken us as a passenger vehicle um, exporter we, we still do more overall because we've got all these buckies but as a pure passenger vehicle they've overtaken us so it, we're getting the risks because those are much shorter logistical supply chains and um, uh, export market destinations. So we're end of hemisphere type place, so we have to get our logistics uh, costs under control and our security of supply. And the state of Transnet at the moment really makes that difficult. So it's all based on road, and that's difficult with the number of volumes, especially if you're trying to increase the volumes. Rail would be a much better option, but it's just not an option. So these decisions are not just that we don't have a policy visibility. We also have serious you know, fundamental uh, image and reputational and really felt disruptions that are happening at these factories so that, are, that are headwinds. So we know that there's a big effort to try and end load shedding. It's going to be a very, it's going to take time. Uh, so there's some action there. And we can see that there's some concessioning and thoughts around uh, rail, but we have to see some action, you know, on these things, because these are really damaging the image of South Africa internationally, and it's getting harder and harder for the domestic OEM CEOs and uh, leaders to try and convince their principals in these different capitals around the world that this is a good place to do business. Thank you. That's the second tag show for this week. Thank you for watching, and join us again next time for more news analysis. Also, don't forget to listen to the audio version of our Engineering News Daily email newsletter.